Uh, good. So welcome to everyone who is who is here at the Kennedy Center and welcome to our, our web audience uh, for the second in this series of interviews that I'm doing that we've called The Art of Political Writing. Um, I'm very happy to welcome uh, tonight Sarda Perry, who was a senior speechwriter and special assistant to President Barack Obama uh, and has, been, has had many other experiences uh, that we're going to talk about tonight. So uh, Sarda, welcome. Uh, delighted. And I, I I thought we would really start at the beginning. Um, we know how, I think we know how engineers become engineers. We know how journalists become journalists, how doctors become doctors. I have no idea how someone becomes a speechwriter. And I wonder if you could take a moment and um, walk us through what, what how you learned to be one, what the building blocks were, what your early jobs that led to being a presidential speechwriter were, and so on. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me. Can you hear me? A little closer. Yeah, a little bit closer. Okay. Um, so I, I don't actually know how anybody becomes a speechwriter either. Uh, <laughs> if you ask all of us, everybody has a different answer to this question. So um, I did not start out in speechwriting. Um, I, uh, after I graduated from college, I went to Tufts down the road. Um, I did Teach for America and got very interested in education policy. As a result of that, moved to Washington. I worked for a small nonprofit that worked with state legislators, um, and I primarily worked on education, healthcare policy, progressive policies. And um, all this time, I, I kind of always knew that I wanted to write in some capacity. I've been interested in writing since I was a little kid, but it wasn't clear to me what job that you know I would actually want to take. I was sort of too political and opinionated at the time to be a journalist, mm -hmm. um, and so I just kind of continued in policy. So. I worked in Washington, then I came here uh, to get my master's degree in public policy, uh, so more policy. Then I graduated from the Kennedy School and went to Capitol Hill to do a policy job. I was a legislative assistant for um, now former Senator Mary Landrieu from Louisiana, which is where I had done Teach for America. And um, I was I, I focused on education and health care and child welfare and a range of other um, domestic issues. And almost as soon as I got my job, uh, I realized that maybe this wasn't quite the job for me. Um, and one day I was at a party in Washington complaining about my job, as one does in Washington. And uh, and a friend of mine said, you know, I know this guy who's a speechwriter. You should talk to him. That sounds like a job that might be good for you. And by the way, this was a friend who I met here at the Kennedy School um, to hold on to your friends. And um, and I said, speech writing, you know, is that, is that even a job? Up until that point, my notion of speech writing was entirely derived from the West Wing. And so, um, and she said, no, it's, it's, it's really a job. <laughs> and so I ended up talking to this guy who had been in the Clinton White House and worked at a firm where other Clinton speech writers, um, with which they had started. And, um, you know, I, I sat down with an interview with these folks, and for the first time in my professional life, I felt like I was speaking with kindred spirits. Mm. Just people who sort of shared my intellectual interests and were fun sparring partners and cared about writing, obviously. And it just, it, it sort of just changed something. Um, and uh, at the time, you know, they weren't hiring, and I was still sort of neat, even a very intense job on the Hill. Um, this was right before. Right around the time President Obama won his election, um, my boss had just won her re-election, and we were off the races on health care. So my, my life became Obamacare for a year and, and um, was uh, very occupied with that and, and wasn't in a position to leave the Hill. But eventually, in 2010, after Obamacare passed and I was very tired, I decided it was time to go. And, um, and so I got hired by this firm called West Wing Writers. Um, and I was 30 and had the only speech I had ever written was my writing test for Western writers. So they really took a chance on me very kindly. Um, and then four and a half years later, the White House called. So that's how that happened. You know, it's, it's funny what you said about when you started in your career, you were too uh, opinionated to be a journalist. That wouldn't be a problem today, but you felt that it was a barrier then. Well, it's so funny because, I mean, yes, exactly. That opinion journalism is kind of a new phenomenon, right? But back then it wasn't, it just that didn't seem like an option. Um, very shortly thereafter, I'd say, you know, the Ezra Kleins of the world kind of sort of forged the blogging industry, you know, and all that happened. But, but at the time, it did not seem like a possibility. Um, you know, so so it's interesting hearing hearing your you know your your narrative that uh, you you know how to write. You'd gone to college. You were working in policy jobs. You, you were you were you were doing writing, but you hadn't written a speech. So 
did once you got the West Wing writers, what did um, you know? Was there a sort of apprenticeship? Was there a template that someone say do this? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you, you sort of you sort of you know fall on your face in your first assignment. I remember my first assignment was um, actually a political speech, and uh, I, I worked on my draft. And and you know there there are at the time a book had just come out by this um, speechwriter named Bob Lerman, um, who had, I think been a Gore speechwriter, and it was called The Art of Political Speechwriter's Companion. Terrific book. It was sort of a how-to, and other colleagues at West Wing had suggested various books. But honestly, you you can't know how to do it until you just do it. And uh, and and part of that is also listening to speeches, figuring out what you like, talking to the person you're writing for to figure out how they work. And we can talk about that very specific craft. But my first speech, you know, I, I sort of labored intensively over this draft, and I handed it to you know, I sent it to the, the partner I was working with. And about five minutes later, he calls me. He comes into my office, and he, he he had printed it out, and he hands it to me, and he says, "Read this first paragraph out loud." And I read it out loud, and what I had thought was a really compelling first paragraph looked nice on the page, but did not make sense to the ear. And that was kind of my first sort of lesson in the difference between writing for the ear and writing for the eye. Uh, do you do you then always read your drafts out loud? Yeah, and then read them again and again and again out loud. I mean, right. <laughs> so, you know, it's, with, I, I sort of think you've answered the question that I'm curious about is what's the difference between an op-ed on the one hand and a speech on the other hand? Is, the, is it, there must be more than just the writing for the ear than for the, than for the eyes, but is, is, otherwise, do you think the art form is similar? I do think it's similar in that a, a speech, you know, the purpose of a speech is to persuade people in the same way that an op-ed is, right? You want someone to feel or think or do something specific. And so in that sense, it is similar. But the truth is that writing for the ear really is different. Um, and, you know, if you think about sort of the history of speech making, you know, back in the day, people would, politicians would give really long speeches because people would travel a great distance to see somebody stand on a literal stump and speak. And so, you know, you wanted to make it worth their while. Um, there were no microphones. So the person who was invariably a man was shouting um, mm -hmm. and speaking in these sort of very lengthy, florid um, ways. And obviously things have changed since then, but this idea that you have to appeal to how people hear things is still relevant and maybe change even more now that people hear things differently and consume information. There's an analog, by the way, between what used to be called print journalism and now I would call text journalism versus broadcast journalism. I'm a, I'm a text journalist, but I've done a little bit of radio writing, and it's a completely different art form. And you said, sort of, well, I thought I knew how to write. I don't know how to write for radio until someone showed me how to write for radio. Um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get in. We have a lot of specifics to get into, but what, what fascinates me, and I'd love for you to, and maybe you want to illustrate it with a speech is that when you're, especially when you're writing for the president, but not only the president, uh, writing a speech is a form of policy making. And I didn't, I didn't learn that until I started researching the ex-presidential speech writer that I'm writing a book about, William Sapphire. But first of all, so could you, could you discuss that a little bit? Why is write, writing a speech part of the policy, policy making process? I think part of what happens in, and this was certainly true in the White House, is that um, people don't necessarily sort of coalesce around a specific policy agenda message until somebody says, hey, the president should give a speech on this. Mm -hmm. So there's an event, and we need to talk about our trade policy. It's not that, there, that a trade policy doesn't exist, but we haven't necessarily prioritized exactly what the most important element of that policy is. We haven't necessarily figured out how we're going to talk about that policy to the American people or to this particular constituency. And so the page of the speechwriter's page is kind of where all of these things are litigated. And as the speechwriter, it's not as though you're a policy person. I was, you know, relatively powerless in the White House in some sense. I was just a speechwriter. But because all of these decisions were kind of being argued over and litigated on my page, you become a central actor in all of this. And part of your job, I think speech writing in any sort of large organization, certainly the White House, but really anywhere, it, it's more of a process job than it is a writing job in a lot of ways. You know, you are managing all of these competing interests, trying to figure out, you know, 
trying to figure out which of their interests need to be met and how they need to be met, who needs to be let down gently, you know, how to sort of incorporate all of the, for example, the lawyer's feedback in a way that still sounds like English that humans speak. And by the way, you have to do all of this while, you know, sort of doing your number one job, which is preserving and protecting the president's voice. And so, you know, it, it can be a really huge challenge, especially when you first start to under, sort of understand all the power dynamics of the building and, you know, whose views really need to be taken into consideration. Um, and, and that's a process job. I, I want to dig into the process more. So in, in, in Sapphire's White House memoir, he talks about taking drafts and walking them to, or, you know, I don't know, driving to the Pentagon and meeting with the Secretary of Defense to discuss, sort of going into Henry Kissinger's office to discuss the draft. Um, did, did, does it still work that way, or, or is it email or text or what? How, how does how did it work for you? So um, all, all of you. So let me maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll explain the process that we had in the White House and then kind of delve into the specifics. So by the time I got to the Obama White House, uh, it was the second term, and so the operation was a pretty well oiled machine. Mm -hmm. And so the process was was this. Um, you know, the speechwriter, our director of speech writing, also a, a Kennedy School grad, uh, Cody Keenan, um, was also a member of the senior staff. This sounds like a conspiracy. I know, it really is. <laughs> um, and uh, so he would go to senior staff meetings every morning, and he would kind of have a general sense of the schedule. You know, speeches that were definitely coming up down the pike, but also sort of things that were coming up quickly. And then we would meet as a speech writing team a few times a week, and he would dole out these assignments. And that was based sort of on, you know, bandwidth, interests, et cetera. Um, also worth noting that the foreign policy speech writers were sort of, there were people who were specifically assigned to write foreign policy. I was a domestic policy speech writer, um, but for reasons of um, clearance, um, among other things, there was sort of a separation. We were all on the same team, but I didn't typically write foreign policy speeches. So Cody would, you know, dole out these speeches, you'd get a, you'd get a, you know, your assignments. And let's just say the speech was happening in a week, which is a pretty standard amount of time you have. So um, I would, you know, work on an outline. I would work on my draft. Initially, when I first started, I might talk through my outline with Cody first. So I would produce a draft, and in, in the production of the draft, I would be doing my own research. I would be talking to policy people in the building. I would often just go to their offices and ask for them to explain whatever obscure policy I was trying to convey. Um, and uh, then I produce a draft. Post so excuse me for interrupting you. In your case, this might be, say, the domestic policy advisor to the president or deputy policy, the domestic policy advisor. Maybe, but honestly, it was more likely that I was going to be talking to the staffer who was most closely aligned with that policy. It. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, worth the, the DPC advisor's time to talk to me about an education policy speech when she could just send me to her education policy team. Right. And more specifically, within her education policy team, she could send me to her higher education person, mm -hmm. her, you know, K-12 person or whoever it was. You know, there were a whole range of experts in the White House. And they were the ones who were having, you know, from my perspective, they were the ones who were communicating with agencies. So it wasn't like I had to call the Department of Education. Uh, you know, Cody might do that around the time of the State of the Union, but on a, on a sort of run-of-the-mill speech that wasn't always necessary. So I would I would produce my draft. Cody would edit it maybe a couple of days before. The day before the president's speech, and I know this sounds like a very tight timeline, but he's a busy guy. Um, the day before the president's speech, say around 10 a.m., after I got Cody's edits, I would circulate the draft to a list, a listserv of about... I don't know, maybe 100, 150 people were on this listserv. They weren't all reading it. This was a this was a pretty robust list of people. Everybody from the National Security Advisor um, all the way to the fact checkers and the lawyers. And then you would add on any relevant policy people. And, you know, it wasn't as though Susan Rice needed to read my speeches all the time, although every time she did, she had a typo. It was really horrifying. Um, and uh, so you would say in this email, okay, here's a draft of the president's remarks. Please send me your edits by 3 p.m. At 5 p.m., their edits would start rolling in. So <laughs> your job at that point was to start the litigation process. You know, hopefully people are sending you edits a little bit earlier, but you know, you could very easily fight over edits over email. And that is, I think, something that people generally do. Maybe this, this was before Slack, maybe they're doing that over Slack now. What I found is that you know, email is where tone goes to die. Yeah. And it is very easy to sort of reject someone's edit or kind of come off as sort of antagonistic. And that is not a productive relationship for a speechwriter to have with other people in the building. 
So frequently, and this was especially true with lawyers, I would just call the office and say, hey, <laughs> you know, I've got your edits. What's the interest behind this particular edit? What were you trying to do? Can we work together to find language that the president would actually say and that sort of meets your interest and make sure that nobody goes to prison? That's, we, that's, we all have that shared interest. So, you know, working together with people and making them feel like they're part of the process too was a way to not antagonize them. So you're trying to get these edits done as quickly as possible. Often the fact checkers would be working into the night and you wouldn't get to resolve those edits until the next day. But at that evening, say around seven or eight, we would send the draft as fast as it possibly, you know, in the best possible shape with all the input to the president's book. So President Obama was an eye owl, um, and he would sort of have a get his big book of homework uh, that he would he would deal with in the evenings. And this included his, you know, schedule and memos and briefings and all that stuff and the speeches for the next day. So overnight he would he would make edits um, typically by hand. And then the next day, his secretary would call us and say, he could, you know, come pick up the folder with the edits, you would make the edits, and then you would send it final to the teleprompter if there was one, and to the person who would sort of print out his book, because we always had a hard copy in case the teleprompter died. Um, and so that was sort of a typical process. It would vary depending, you know, the bigger the speech, maybe we would have more lead time, and or, and or we would probably talk to him about what he wanted ahead of time so that we knew that we were definitely incorporating what he wanted versus the kind of speech that he was doing frequently or that he had done many times before where you didn't necessarily need his input because you, you know, he pays you because you can get into his head. You knew. You knew. Um, and give us a sense of the gamut of, of speeches. I sort and, and I don't want to talk yet about the State of the Union because I gather that's like, you know, that's the Super Bowl, that's the most important one. But I envision sort of, I don't know, a portrait unveiling, a uh, a lunch honoring so-and-so. This is the sort of thing. And do we also, does this also include toast to, toast to the dinner? Um, yes. So, again, all of the above. So, you know, the president has to deliver a whole range of remarks. So they could be sort of substantive policy remarks to various groups of health care or trade policy or whatever it may be. They could be what we call rose garden rubbish. So the... <laughs> That's a term of art inside the White House. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, the, I love it. <laughs> ceremonial kind of speeches that, that he had to deliver. There would be things that would happen every year Memorial Day, Veterans Day, mm. you know, certain holidays. Um, pardoning the turkey, I think, guess. Pardoning the turkey, uh -huh. always a fun one. Uh -huh. um, he also, I think they've now stopped this practice, but the president's ra weekly radio address uh -huh. had evolved into a, a web address, basically, uh -huh. a video. So uh -huh. we would have to write those every week. Um, what well, the fun, we always did fun ones, you know, so uh, Obama's loved music and art. We have a lot of music performances in the White House, um, and I'm a music junkie, so I always got assigned those, which was really fun. So there, there really were a range. And then if there were a state visit and a state, you know, state arrival ceremony, you would have to do those remarks. In terms of toast for state dinners, um, there would be a toast that would have to be prepared ahead of time. So you know, everything you can think of. And, you know, sometimes you would give him talking points for something that he didn't really need them for. Mm -hmm. You know, President Obama is a brilliant, accomplished speaker and can speak to anybody without notes, but, you know, you always want to prepare them. And did, would you typically go? To a speech? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, depending on where it was. Um, but yes, um, if it was in the White House, I would try to catch it. Um, and if it was in town, probably, you know, it just depended. And so... From your description, it sounds like it would be relatively unusual for you to interact directly with the president on, on a speech. It wouldn't be necessary, or, or, or am I mishearing you? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say unusual. It, was, it just didn't have to happen for every single speech. Uh, so maybe a more important speech or a more complicated speech or yes. more controversial? Exactly. And it might be a situation where we have a bunch of those coming down the pike. So Cody just calls everybody who's going to be writing a speech, and we just do one meeting to save us time. Um, or it could be, you know, sometimes what would happen is that a speech that I didn't think I needed to talk to him about, I would get called into the Oval to talk about it after I sent the draft. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you don't know that actually he does have input on this one. Um, and the policy people were, you know, it wasn't enough to get input from all of his advisors. He really has something to say about this. And other times we could just do it through the edits. You know, Barack Obama could write his own speeches uh, if yes. he wanted to, but he hires us, or he hired us because. He was the leader of the free world and didn't exactly have time to be sitting around <laughs> writing speeches. And so 
our job was to be able to do it for him without him having to worry about it so much, right? Without, without and him trusting that we could capture the essence of what he would want to say and how he would want to say it. But I, want, I wanted to get to that exactly. You mentioned earlier that, that he was a brilliant uh, speaker, but he, but he also is considered one of one of the best writers who's ever been president of the United States. He's an accomplished writer. Now, I could see that either as a speech writer, I could see that being either wonderful or terrifying, but you're trying to write a speech for a man who's an excellent writer. Uh, yeah, I think it's both of those things. So uh, every speech for him was just, you know, terror, self-loathing. <laughs> what am I doing with my life? Why am I here? It's like word documents torturing me. Um, because you, because you, because he was the sort of most important audience, and you know, the one with the highest standards. So you didn't want to fail him, and um, you know, you know, you didn't want to disappoint Dad. So, um, so yes, there was that. However, I will also say it was like taking a master writing class is my job. You know, every time he edited a draft, it got better. He would cross out four words and put the one word, one right one in. He's just very good at this. Um, and I learned a lot about how to structure a speech from him. You know, he's sort of lawyerly in his ability to dictate an outline. Um, mm. And so uh, I, it was just a really great learning experience, not to mention the fact that I was on this terrific you know, team of terrific writers, and we all worked together so well, and I learned so much from all of them and their experiences that were different from mine. Oh, about how big was the staff or the team? It varied during my time there. You know, sometimes we were smaller than we needed to be. Um, mm. but I would say there were about five domestic policy speech writers, and then two foreign policy speech writers, one of whom was Ben Rhodes, who was also the deputy national security advisor, so he had a lot of other responsibilities. But, uh, and, and, and just to be clear, you're writing almost exclusively for the president, not for any other cabinet members, not for the vice president, et cetera, right? Not almost exclusively. Exclusively, exclusively. Yeah. okay. You know, once I got into a, 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 a little sort of tip, not tip, I, I was working on a rare instance that I was working on a foreign policy-related speech. And I got edits back from one of the directorates in the NSC, the National Security Council. Having never worked with them before, you know, you see anything related to national security and your heartbeat you know, starts racing. Especially as a domestic policy exactly. speech writer. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who was important, who wasn't. If you say this, you know, that stock price is going to tank according mm -hmm. to the, you know, international economics people. Or if you say this, that country is going to feel antagonized and, you know, we could be in real trouble. I'm just a lowly speech writer. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm sitting here taking all these crazy edits, just not English edits, you know. Um, <laughs> and the draft, I don't know what happens to this draft, but it's not good. And I send it to Terry, our de deputy director of speech writing, who is also our foreign policy speech writer. And he says, look, he says, sorry, look, you know, we are, there's seven of us in this White House whose job it is to protect the president's voice. That is your job. Don't let these people intimidate you. They mean well, but they might have a different agenda. And so it's our job to turn all of this stuff into English and figure out what really needs to be said and what doesn't. And sort of intellectually, I understood that. But at the moment, working on something I hadn't worked on before, was it, I couldn't necessarily apply that until I had him kind of fucking me up and giving me permission to do that. That's really great. You know, and I, uh, one of the reasons I asked the question was I learned last week because of a very funny article I read in the Wall Street Journal about the Attorney General and his affection for Taylor Swift, that the Attorney General has three speech writers on staff, and that, that surprised me. You thought it would be more? I thought it would be fewer. I, mean, I don't know how many speeches the Attorney General gives, but I guess that shows what I know. Yeah, I, I'm not as familiar with agency speech writing, but I know that they really do give a lot of speech yeah. And sometimes they are also tasked with writing for deputies. Mm -hmm. the justice is huge. Um, what's the interplay between the speech writing staff and the communication staff in the White House? Um, I cannot speak to for the current White House. I bet it's evolved even more towards digital than it did with us. But by the time I got there, um, our communications director, when I got there, was Dan Pfeiffer, and he was he's a really uh, brilliant digital strategist as well. And he worked hard to sort of bring together the traditional comms press side of things with the digital side of things. And as speech writers, we try to, I think, not just accommodate that, but advance all that. So we would, you know, work with the digital strategy folks to say, hey, maybe you want to pull this line out to tweet out when the president's giving a speech, or maybe, you know, we're happy to help you edit this Facebook post or whatever it might have mm -hmm. been. But there, there was a, a sort of a really good, I think, um, partnership between all the different elements of the comms team.
Um, and I'd like to mention that um, I'm going to reserve about the last 15 minutes for Q&A. We have a microphone here, but I like these to be as interactive as possible. So if you feel like you can't wait, uh, stand up and, and, and ask your question. I'd love to bring you in uh, when, when you're ready. I can't help but you talk about lawyers vetting your speeches. And um, I'm just fascinated to know if you know from the speech writer uh, fraternity and sorority in, in Washington, how the heck that worked under President Trump, who would stand up there and make three-hour speeches that seemed to be off the cuff. I mean, I think the many indictments that he's made can tell you how that works. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It, it was, it's, it's a funny thing because I know that the way our White House worked in terms of having a very robust fact-checking department, um, and they were responsible not just for fact-checking our speeches, but for sort of vetting everything. You know, people who would be name checked in speeches or people who were being nominated. I mean, it was it was an incredible department. Plus the lawyers who were very fastidious about things mm -hmm. like ethics. Um, it's it's it was it, it was such whiplash to go from that where we were under such you know self scrutiny and really careful to go from that to to the Trump administration was really something. There's this there was this day when um, in, at Halloween in 2016. Um, I was on, I was traveling um, with the president that day, um, and so I wasn't in the office, but we had the, we were decorating, I, my office was in the old executive office building, which is a, you know, sort of a, right across West Exec from, from the West Wing, where most White House staff works. And our speech writing suite had decorated our doors for Halloween because a lot of staff's kids would come around to trick or treat. And on the door, this was right around election time, uh, on our door, I think either one of our interns or one of the speechwriters had written, had put up um, "Don't Boo Vote," which was something that President Obama was saying during political speeches every time he mentioned yet yeah, the you know Republicans people would boo and so he would say "Don't Boo Vote." So the pun was "Don't Boo Vote" as you know a Halloween joke. They put this up. Well, the lawyers called the speechwriting office and said, "This is this is a violation of the Hatch Act. You have to take this down." So that's that's the level of scrutiny and you know care and judiciousness that we operated under, and just you know the astonishing whiplash of the, of the subsequent administration is is almost hard to wrap your mind around. And what you realize is that in a lot of ways, what everybody was operating under was not necessarily laws, although there was one, but norms. You just don't do that. You just don't behave that way. But when he pushed it, and he did behave that way. There wasn't a whole lot of blowback. There wasn't a lot. There were no consequences. No, not yet, as, as, as you referenced. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by this notion that you write sometimes speeches um, before a major policy event is going to happen, and so you write for two different outcomes. You know, Sapphire once wrote a speech for President Nixon uh, if the Apollo 11 astronauts did not come home, he, he wrote a whole draft of this. If they had died, what what Nixon would have said. Um, you you met, you referenced that you did you would do two drafts, for example, on Supreme Court decisions that were expected. Can you talk about that? Sure. So um, an example of this is that um, in 2015, the Supreme Court was going to be ruling on two big cases in one week. Um, one was an ACA case, the Affordable Care Act case. And the other was whether marriage equality would be recognized. Um, this was also the week, um, a few days after the um, Charleston massacre, where a white supremacist murdered um, black churchgoers in Charleston. Um, and it was, you know, the end of that sort of 10 day period was capped by the president giving a eulogy at that church. Um, Cody has actually written a book about this. Um, but anyway, I was tasked with writing the marriage equality remarks. And so, as, as you say, Adam, I thought I would have to write two drafts. You know, we win or we lose. We, marriage equality is, is legalized or it is not. Um, I am very superstitious, so I was not going to write the victory speech. Um, mm -hmm. But it turned out, you know, lawyers called us and said, actually, there are four possible outcomes. And they kind of walked us through the four potential, you know, legal outcomes. And so what I did was... Um, after talking to them and making sure I could explain them in English, uh, I just wrote sort of the, the meat of each one, you know, so that I knew that I had those ready and so, sort of general language, sort of contextualizing those potential outcomes. But not knowing exactly what was going to happen, I knew that as soon as those decisions got announced, the next 35 minutes would just be, you know, 
locked down, heads down, just you know, rip it out of you. Um, and that sometimes happens. Uh, that you have to do things at the last minute. But but yes, we were asked to prepare, and and that does happen. I mean, you know, Supreme Court decisions are sort of an obvious one. But even just not knowing how a bill is going to go, um, you might have to write a couple of different versions of it. Or you know, political speeches, victory speeches, and and concession speeches. Um, you know, the famous story about. President Obama's uh, New Hampshire speech in 2008, when he had just won the Iowa caucuses, but he lost the New Hampshire primary to Hillary Clinton. Uh, the story, I was on the campaign, but the story is that uh, they had written a victory speech. And so uh, President Obama said, just change the top, and I'm going to give the exact same speech. And, um, and it was a great speech. He still said the things that he wanted to say, the things that were meaningful to him, but different circumstances. Uh, when I was um, when I when I when I began the process that ultimately ultimately led me to you, I was I got curious to know who the chief speechwriter was in the Biden administration, and I talked to a few people who didn't know, and then I googled it, and I eventually I found out. Now I remember his last name. I think it's Reddy. Yeah, Vinay Reddy. Vinay Reddy. But you 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 know where I'm going with this. I had a relatively difficult time figuring out who the chief speechwriter to President Biden is. And this, and there's a reason that I had a hard time, and I think it's it's one of your passions. And so, go ahead and take a stab at why I didn't know, and I'll I'll guide you more if you need it. I'm guessing because he uh, chooses anonymity. Yeah, he doesn't take credit. He doesn't. Uh, so, uh, Vinay is a great guy, terrific writer, um, just an amazing sort of consummate staffer. Um, I've known him for a long time, and he was uh, Biden's chief speechwriter when he was vice president when I was on the president team. So we've known each other for a long time. So I'm biased. But um, but you know, then I um, and I share this sentiment is old school in that he he really is in the background. He does not talk about his work, and I think he understands as we all do that this work is collaborative, right? You're not you're not the person who is out there speaking these speeches. You are working with someone and helping them along with a whole lot, lot of other people. By the way, lots of other people in the building are working with you to make these speeches happen. It's not about you, and so. I think he rightly uh, chooses not to be part of the story because then that would turn the story into a process story. And there's nothing more tedious in Washington than process stories, which the press corps loves, but the American people don't care about, right? That doesn't matter. You mean like how did this speech come yes. together? Who contributed what? Who argued with whom? Yes. And they're and they're kind of meaningless. Um, and so I think he rightly sort of I'll take. I'll, I'll 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 disagree as, yeah, as no, a journalist should. Yes. Yeah. Um. But but I think he just sort of doesn't want to distract from what's really important. So he doesn't have a social media presence. He just kind of puts his head down and does the work. Um. You've you, you've taken issue recently with another writer <laughs> named John Meacham. Does he say Meacham? Meacham. Um. What what's your beef with John Meacham? What is my beef with John Meacham? Um. <laughs> Well, in this particular context, the, the, I just uh, wrote a piece for Slate on Friday. And my, my beef with him is that um, he has been asked, uh, he is sort of a, I guess, a thought partner, to use a, a term of art, uh, uh, for, for President Biden. President Biden, I think, is a longtime fan of his, has read many of his books, and occasionally calls um, on him to sort of provide some thoughts for speeches, especially when they are related to history. John Meacham is a presidential biographer and um, former editor of Newsweek. Um, and, you know, that's all well and good. Uh, you know, can I rely on our legislature? There's nothing wrong with calling upon historians to help you. There's nothing wrong with calling upon outside folks to help you, using your speechwriters. You know, as I said, it's collaborative. It just seems as though every time Meacham was called for a speech, Politico reports the next day that he was involved in the speech. And the only, I don't know if he's actually leaking this information. Maybe he's not. But it's to nobody else's benefit <laughs> um, but his. And, you know, I think that that's just kind of tacky. Um, we are ghostwriters. We don't talk about our work. I mean, after the fact, if you want to write your memoir, and, you know, as Cody did with the president's blessing, he, he earned that right after 10 years of working for him. Uh, that's that's a different story. But to kind of talk about your work in that way, I just find sort of tacky. Uh, he also has given President Biden lines that he himself has used, which is just, you know, the I don't know, third rule of speech writing. You don't do that. You don't give someone lines you yourself are using because you basically 
sort of compel the press to then report on this and reveal that you were the person who was helping my speech. So that's one of my beefs. My other beef with him is that I just don't necessarily buy his uh, understanding of the moment we're in. I don't think he really understands that you can draw a straight line from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump. And the sort of disintegration of the Republican Party is not about these individual actors and you know the, the rise of Trump as this one villain. It is about systems. It is about many people, including his heroes, Reagan and H.W. Bush, who are implicated in allowing the extremist elements of that party to take hold over time. And I, I think it's disingenuous to not at least acknowledge that. I understand why President Biden wouldn't necessarily want to go down that path when talking about where we are to the American people when he's trying to sort of unify everybody and not villainize anybody. Totally get that. But you need to understand it if you're going to be the person whose historical understanding and narrative America has come to rely on. And he has a disproportionate amount of power and authority in Washington. Um, he's hardly ever critiqued, and so I just felt like I needed to stand up for my fellow speech writers. Uh, and I, I, I know you were... I know you were channeling the, the opinion of other speechwriters because I've heard I've heard from some of them since, since your piece. You know, he, he is in a remarkable position, also from a position of partisanship. In that, you know, he wrote a biography of George H. W. Bush. Uh, you know, he was had this very prominent role in his funeral. A friend of mine who worked at Newsweek commented to me, you know, he sort of chuckles seeing John Meacham as a courtier to the Bush family, um, but. Which he became, and but but now he's writing, he's he's contributing to speeches for President Biden. Um, I could, so it's shocking, and you've made the case against it. I could make uh, I could make the 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 alternative argument that you know President Biden cares about bipartisanship. He wants to show and demonstrate bipartisanship. So what better way to do that than get than to get input from a um, a, a, a writer with Republican um, connections or or, or friendships. I don't begrudge Meacham's relationships with Republicans or the fact that he has said he has voted for Republicans. I don't, I'm not against bipartisanship. Um, I worked for a moderate Democrat in the Senate. We frequently worked with Republicans. I'm not sort of a reflexive leftist on that particular issue. Where I take issue is that, and, and again, there are many people who have sort of, you know, were tied to Republicans and became, you know, Trump just pushed them over the edge. Mm -hmm. Where I take issue is just that it you need to at least be able to acknowledge those elements of the party, you know? And he lionizes those folks in a way that I just think is wrong, <laughs> just, you know, factually incorrect. Um, and and it's really interesting because he sort of says that he talks, that he um, wants to present these great men that he writes about in all their flaws. But he only does that to a point, you know, um, and and it's, that's especially true with sort of his recent presentations of, say, you know, a Reagan or, or an H.W. Bush. And I just find that unsatisfying. Uh, but I but I, I agree with you that, you know, Biden in particular is somebody who has always maintained relationships on both sides of the aisle. He is, you know, a senator, senator, and and values that. And I think one of the reasons he won is because he was able to reach independents and make them believe, as he is, that he is persuadable. Um, you know, to, to persuade, you have to appear persuadable. And he, and he is. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, there is there's merit to that. I just question Misha's scholar, his sort of history and the, and the narrative he tells, and I, I question his behavior. You, you, I encourage you all to read to read this piece in Slate. It, it, it was it was really wonderful. Before we leave the topic completely, you had a, you had a sort of laugh out loud, um, fra memorable phrase in that piece called "men with pens." Could you? Ex oh, men with men with I get it. Men without pens. Thank you. Yeah. Could you explain what that is? Yeah, the men with men without pens. Um, and you know, I did not coin this term. Somebody else in my world did. I, I wish I could remember who it was so I could credit them. Uh, so the men without pens are every speechwriter's nightmare. <laughs> this is who these people are. They are advisors who frequently mean well, communications advisors, you know, strategists, and they mean well and frequently. And they'll be in the meeting with you and the, and the principal, whether it's the president or the candidate or whatever, and they'll just throw out ideas. Why not just do X, Y, Z? And you're just throwing out all these ideas, and, you know, depending on their path, depending on their authority, this might become a directive from the principal. But then when it's time to put that thing on paper, 
They say, you got that? You good? <laughs> All right, great. And then they go and have a drink. And you're just left holding the bag. You're the, the speechwriter is the person with the pen who actually has to write the words, who has to turn these you know, disparate, random ideas into a coherent speech. And those men without pens often have a lot of power <laughs> in these conversations. Um, because they are, they have these lofty titles like strategists and you know, communications advisors. And so they have a health size power and they kind of screw the speech writer over sometimes. Um, so that's my goal. Um, I don't know what the gender breakdown was in, in the Obama White House. It seems like the vast majority of the speech, presidential speech writer community is, is male. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? You know, and I don't know exactly what question I'm asking you, other than to take your temperature where you where you feel like we are right now. Not great. Um, yes, there are not. It, it is a male dominated, uh, uh, not profession, but space. Um, and I think it's because of the way these jobs come about. You know, people are on campaigns, then they give their friends jobs, um, and People don't realize that there are women out there who could do these jobs. And I think the Obama campaign in particular, um, there, there was uh, one incredible woman, Sarah Horowitz, who went on to become Mrs. Obama's speechwriter later, but was on the campaign and just an extraordinary talent. Um, but the rest was, were, were guys, mostly young guys, talented, um, but, but they only knew each other. So they, it's not like they were reaching out to other people to involve them. Um, and to Cody's credit, you know, I think he hired me specifically because he wanted somebody with a different perspective um, and life experience. But, but yeah, it is, it is, it is pretty male. It is definitely getting better. The current breakdown is certainly better, and the current chief speechwriter has made it a real, made a real effort to diversify, not just on gender, but in other ways too. Um, I think I'm one of maybe before this administration. I think maybe I was. A, second or third woman of color to ever be a presidential mm -hmm. speech writer. I mean, it, the numbers are not great. So so I, I think it's changing for sure. And people really are making an effort to diversify writers' rooms now. Um, and uh, I don't have, I mean, we have to ask them why they don't hire me. Um, I have one last uh, question before we go to all, uh, all, all, all of you, which is, um, but both before your time in the Obama White House and now, I think, you do non-political work as well. I'm curious to know well, uh, if you could tell us about the differences between writing, say, for a CEO versus writing for the President of the United States, and do you enjoy it as much? And, yeah. It depends on the CEO. Um, I, I am fortunate that I get to mostly work for people I really like and um, it gets you interesting interesting work. It is different um, in that the stakes can be really different, and their interests and power centers are different. But, you know, the private sector, the philanthropy sector, the nonprofit sector, these are all, you know, sectors with enormous power and influence and the ability to really shape events. So you can work for any of these, you know, entities and really feel like you're a part of conversations that matter. Um, I will say, um, I think that what's similar is that these large organizations are similar to the White House and that they are all these huge bureaucracies with, with lots of different areas of tension, lots of people with different kinds of interests. And so it's still a process job. No matter where I go, it's still a process job. So, so a client might, this, for example, want you to talk to all sorts of senior yeah. vice presidents Absolutely. for the, C, the speech that the CEO is going to give. Absolutely. That reminds me when I wrote articles about big companies, if, if they were cooperating, I needed to meet with a lot more executives than if they weren't cooperating. I always enjoyed the, the not cooperation a whole lot more, but I could see how you couldn't write a speech uh, for the CEO without, without doing that. Right. Um, please, I'd love for you to come to the mic and ask your questions. Uh, don't, don't be shy. And that, that includes anybody on the web. Do we have We questions? have one. Okay, Carol, go ahead. So they asked, how do you preserve and protect the president's style and voice and yet create the speeches to your strengths? To your to like to the writer's strengths? To your personal strengths. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna just explain how one thinks about figuring out someone's voice, which we didn't really talk about. Great. And then and then I'll sort of connect that to this the answer. So um, whenever people ask a speechwriter, you know, how you figure out someone's voice. Um, I, I always think it's, it's really about figuring out someone's voice is not about how they talk, it's about how they think. 
Mm. And so what you need to do is figure out how they see the world. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. If you're fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with the person you're working with, great. You can sit down and chat with them, and that's great. If you're working for the president of the United States, who's very busy and not going to chit chat with you, um, then you have the benefit of all of their, you know, in my case, I could read everything, every speech Barack Obama ever gave. I could read his books. I could watch every time he was on Jimmy Fallon. You know, you could really sort of get into their head. And uh, for those those years that I worked for him, I really immersed myself in the, you know, inhabited the mind and soul of Barack Obama, which is kind of creepy, but. But that's kind of that's kind of what you have to do. And I would wake up in the morning thinking, you know, something would happen in the news, and I wouldn't think, gee, what does Sarah think about this? I would think, what does Barack Obama think? Mm-hmm. That's your job to sort of see the world through their eyes, so that whatever comes your way, whatever speech comes your way, or problem comes your way, you could imagine how they would approach it. Because you're trying to make an argument. If they don't like a certain turn of phrase or whatever, you can fix that stuff later. But you can't fundamentally do the do the job unless you understand how they see the world. Um, and then in terms of the the question, I mean, I guess my answer is that it's just, it's just not about you, you know. So preserving their their protecting what they are saying is the job. And your job is to sort of help them become the best version of themselves, channel, you know, their ideas and the way they think, um, maybe help with great research and corralling all the resources and writing well. But at the end of the day, it is not about you. And, you know, back to my Nietzschean answer, we are there to sort of serve the principle. If I wanted to write a speech that I really loved, that was about me, then I should get up at the microphone and deliver it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which means running for office or getting appointed. Uh-huh. Then you run for office. Um, but if that's not the case, then your job is to sort of let it go a little bit, right? You love, it. you just love this sentence. You love this line. But the speaker, it just doesn't work for them. It doesn't feel good. Cut it. Because if they deliver that line, it's going to sink, mm-hmm. right? It's not going to go over well. Speeches are good when they are delivered with authenticity. And so if a person doesn't feel like they can do this, they can say the thing that you wrote for them, that's about it. No, it, it occurs to me that, because you know, with the Kennedy artists in particular, I think it's interesting for people to think about their careers. And, and what I'm hearing you say, the job of being a presidential speechwriter requires a healthy ego because you're in a very intense environment in the White House, but not a super healthy ego where you want it to be about you. Is that a fair? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it requires an ego so much as some some semblance of security, security, confidence. Yeah, just a sense that you. Yeah, and, and that's really hard initially because you're not sure. You sort of feel like a fraud. You know, in negotiations, they talk about sort of principal agent theory. You know, whether you're you're representing a principal appropriately. And at first, frankly, you're not sure. When I started writing for President Obama, I didn't know whether I was really accurately representing what he would want to do. So I just faked it. I just said, this is what he wants to say. Mm-hmm. And, and eventually that became true. Um, but you sort of have to operate with some amount of authority on that, um, you know, false or otherwise, and then it, and it becomes true. But yes, it, it is that you do at some point have to let it go and, and accept that it's not about you. And I, you know, I, I wonder if this if this profession actually does attract people who sort of like to be in the background a bit more, um, and uh, until they maybe change professions as as sapphire. Yeah. Um. Oh, please. Hey. Uh, thank you so much. It's been great. So, um, I'm an active duty uh, Air Force officer, and so like. I can talk to somebody about military budgeting and like all the things we need to fix with it, but that is not always something that is interesting to other people. So like policy, I think, has a a possibility of being really dry. So how do you engage in the speech writing to like bring excitement about stuff that maybe doesn't match people's interests when they're entering, like when they're watching the speech? That's a great question. So... It is true that policy can be dry, which is why we always say, don't talk about policies, talk about people. Talk about how the policies are going to affect real people. So I don't necessarily need to know the details of DOD's procurement budget and exactly how those numbers were derived. What I need to know is that we are spending this money to purchase these particular helmets because they're going to save X number of soldiers from traumatic brain injury. And then that soldier is going to be able to go home and, you know, go back to their family and live a healthy life. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying this off the top of my head, but you get what I'm saying. 
So we want to talk about people, not policies and programs. And we want to talk about benefits, not features. What I mean by that is, you guys ever guys watch car commercials and they talk about how much horsepower a car has? What on God's earth is horsepower? I mean, I don't know what that means in my life. You know what I find a lot more compelling? Those Subaru commercials where they show the person who's, you know, driven the car to the top of a beautiful uh, vista and they and they now they get this great view and they can fit all their kids in the car. I mean, that I can see. I can see how the horsepower affects people's lives and how they are now enjoying the benefits of this car. So I would say storytelling and then turning numbers and policies into benefits. What I mean by that is, is things that people can wrap their minds around. So, you know, a, one trick is if you have to use data, just make the data something that people can understand. This is very crude, but instead of saying a trillion dollars, which means nothing to people, you know, it's taking however many dollar bills and, you know, enough to wrap around the earth 10 times. I'm just, again, making this up, but you, you need people to visualize what you're talking about and you need them to care about it by creating stories, right? Stories have characters and conflict, someone, someone to root for, someone to root against, tension. Those are the things that bring policies to life. And I think what's hard for policy people, and we're all at the Kennedy School, so we're all policy people to some degree, is this notion that if I don't say this detail, if I don't give them this number or this detail about the program, something is lost. That they, they won't really get it. And I think we just have to reframe how we see this. It's not about the details for most people, right? That's not the thing that's going to stick. For you, yes, because you are deeply passionate about DOD procurement policy. But for the average person, that's not the thing that's going to get them to care about this. And that's the most important thing, that they care about it. How do you get them to care about it? Tell a story. My name is Adam Bogg, and I'm a physician in the UK, but I, I ended up doing some writing and speech writing during the pandemic response um, in the National Health Service. And I have a question about men without pens. So I'm going to obviously read your article. I wasn't aware of it before. Um, you said that these people come in with their strategies and their ideas, and they have a chat and they go off to the bar. They are powerful and influential, but my impression, or at least my much more limited experience, is that actually what happens is what gets written down and then what's, what gets said. So my impression is that, in fact, you have got quite a lot more power than you're letting on. And so, like, how, I don't know, like, is that an, a correct assessment or, like, how do you um, make sense of that? And, and I, I pre, I've found your remarks extremely thoughtful, um, but clearly you also have, like, your own view and your own sense of history and your own sense of, like, the moment of rape. And so, yeah, just, like, how do you hold, how do you hold, how does one hold oneself in check in those types of conversations? Yeah. Um, and, and I was pretty glib about how I described men without pens. I mean, there are plenty of advisors who, including men without pens, who have a great deal of value to add, and we need them. Um, so I was being glib. Um, no, you're right. Speech writers do have a weird amount of, of power in some sense, especially if, if you're not being sort of, if the principal actually trusts you and isn't rewriting all your stuff all the time. You know, if you, if you really do have a good sense of them, Absolutely, speech writers have power. It goes back to the first question you asked about whether the policy is made on the page. To some extent, it is. It is sort of litigated there. And you're kind of helping to determine what gets elevated and what doesn't, what details get left in and what doesn't. So absolutely, there is power there. I think what I meant is that sometimes very senior advisors, very senior men without pens, also have the ear of the, the principal in a way that you don't especially in politics, because they are also driving the political policy, they are driving the political strategy. And so in those instances, you can be asked to do something that doesn't necessarily make sense for a speech or be very hard to accomplish in a reasonable way. And those are the times that I think it gets really challenging. But I absolutely agree with you that speech writers have power. In terms of checking oneself, I mean, I think it goes back to, again, the initial, you know, for the question about keeping yourself out of it, you know, you, you tend to have a lot of checks, the principal being the primary check. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the president's not going to say something he doesn't agree with that I put on the page, right? And um, we all have our sort of, well, not necessarily agendas, although we certainly do, but we all have our own you know, perspectives. You know, in general, I've tried to work for people, and this was certainly true with President Obama. 
I did this as I don't know if I agreed with every single thing that he believed or did, but fundamentally I shared his values. You know, we were kind of coming at things from the general, a, a generally good place. And he was somebody who wanted his advisors to disagree. He wanted them to challenge him. He wanted them to present him with different options. I think that's the best kind of leader in any circumstance, right? And so it's okay to present your view. And if they disagree with it, they'll tell you and you know, you move on. Great. So I'm just curious, Bill, well, thanks for that uh, for the illuminating discussion. And uh, um, I We've seen in President Obama's speeches, he uses a lot of contrast. You know, like uh, this being this, and this is the alternative here, and it goes so well. So, uh, were you working on those kind of templates, uh, or was that uh, something that your team engaged into it, and what is the importance of that? And I also wanted to know did he memorize his speeches, uh, or he was just uh, very, very comfortable? I mean, in the sense that it flowed as extempore all the time for him. Yeah, uh, well, I can answer the second question first. He it just flows really well for him. He's very good at this. Um, so I I can't imagine a circumstance where he would have had time to memorize speeches. He does have a very good memory, but he can just deliver. You know, he's been doing this for a long time. He's a professional, so he knows how to deliver a speech. And these are speeches that he had obviously read and edited, so he knew them well enough. Um, but he has the ability to deliver speech with you know great conviction and authenticity um in terms of your first question i mean that's a it's not necessarily something that was a template but this idea of sort of serving contrast in an argument is a sort of very classic mode of persuasion right so you know some people say this other people say this and that's also a very president obama way of thinking and communicating yeah. right he's this really measured lawyer he likes to present all sides of the story and give everybody their due Right, you know, he sort of likes to show empathy for everyone. You rarely saw him just sort of blatantly call people out unless he was doing it with humor um, in a humor situation or somebody had really done something unreasonable. Mm -hmm. But typically, on a lot of issues, he would say reasonable people can disagree. Mm -hmm. um, so that there was that element of it. And then just there are some sort of conventions that one might use. So, in terms of structuring a speech, you might sort of open with a, an attention getter, you know, to get people's hook. And then you Lay out the problem. What you know? What is the problem we're trying to solve? Here's the solution I'm going to propose. Here's what the world will look like if we follow through on my proposal. Here's what the world will look like, or here's what it will look like. World will look like if we don't, we still, yeah. right? And then some sort of call to action. So that's a really typical structure, and that's probably a lot of what you're hearing too. I think you first, yeah, please. Hi, thank you for coming to the Kennedy School again. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to you when you came in for Professor Wilkinson's class. Oh, right. um, I'm very intrigued by your comment on the actual process management and speech writing. And so when you're faced with, you know, all these people coming in with their advices at 5 p.m. when it was Stuart and Three, how do you manage that in terms of what people wanted to go into and, and into the speech and the order that they wanted to to go into, but how do you go back to them to say, this is not exactly what I want to do, but I still want to maintain the relationship with you? I would say, I, going back to what I said earlier, the, my tendency is to pick up the phone or go to their office. I know that sounds really simple, but I really think that just being able to talk to someone or be face to face with them is sort of the first rule of all of this, or for me is, is, a, is a tactic that is, a, is an approach that works. The second thing I think is just sort of saying, look, here are, I hear what, is this what you were trying to do? Is this, is this what your interest was? You know, sort of repeating back to them to really get what they were trying to do. I see what you were trying to do. Here's why this won't work. For, I think this won't work for this speech. Or here's why I can't fit this in over here. Because the president is trying to do this. Or we don't have enough space to include that particular detail. However, we can put it in the fact sheets we're going to be sending out to the press and all the interest groups later. You know, so if there's more details, we can put that there. Absolutely. You know, giving them some other way to make sure that their views are included. Um, and then letting them sort of rebut me. You know, here's why I think this won't work in this speech right now. Here's what the president wants to do. What do you think? Right? So not just sort of unilaterally declaring, even if that's what's happening on paper, not just unilaterally declaring that I have spoken and this is it. But just sort of saying, what do you think? Does that make sense to you? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Almost invariably, they do. 
Um, and, and so, so much of this is interpersonal, right? It's not, it's not just sort of writing and editing in a bloodless fashion. It is about being able to communicate in, in both directions with people and understand them and then help them understand where you're coming from and hopefully end up in a place where maybe they still disagree. And I definitely have those cases where people didn't like what I did in the end. But then after the speech is over and it went well, <laughs> more often than not, they don't bring it up again, right? They're not unhappy about it. They get why you did what you, what you did. But at the very least, even if, if, if they don't end up agreeing and they're a little bit upset with you, you know, you can't avoid conflict, but you can at least sort of manage it, right? And, and just make sure that they understand that you meant nothing personal, you meant no harm, but, but your job is to protect the president. And honestly, that often means that in our case, we have to be the the proverbial bad guy a little bit, right? I have to take the hit. I have to take the, I'm the person who's going to sort of say, I can't let this happen. You could be mad at me. I'm sorry. And, you know, just sort of be okay with that. We have at least two more questions. We're going to run over by just a few minutes, but please. Hi, my name is Conrad. Thank you very much for this great talk. Uh, I have two short questions. Uh, the first one is uh, about your journey, if you don't mind. You mentioned that uh, some of the great speechwriters um, well, started to learn uh, speech writing on the job. Uh, but I want to ask about your early years. Uh, did you always find that you had this gift of creative writing or uh, the gift of the gap, uh, maybe, and then you developed it into uh, speech writing on the, on the job? And the second question is, uh, well, uh, workshop related. Do you, as a speech writer, do you still keep um, a glossary of uh, the terms of phrase that you want to use in your future speech? Some questions. Um, my parents would say I definitely had the gift of gab um, <laughs> at a very early age, um, never shutting up. Um, but I think I always liked writing. I just always gravitated towards it. I was always a, a voracious reader. I'm still a voracious reader. I suspect a lot of people here are probably similar. Um, we just like the word. In fact, my first uh, discovery of William Sapphire was probably when I was in middle school. I grew up in New Jersey, and we got the Star Ledger and the New York Times. Which I read every day, and I read William Sapphire's on language column was twice a week um, from the time I was very young. I, I just loved that column because it was on language. Um, only later did I discover his political views, um, but that doesn't negate his beautiful writing about language. Um, not only is it is it a common comment that I hear, but I I meet many people who are not particularly political who don't know he wrote about politics, which is really funny. So funny. <laughs> but, but I always did gravitate towards, and I always knew I. I liked writing and um, certainly was encouraged to do it and, and validated along the way. But I think writing is such a, it's such an odd thing because it is weirdly personal. You feel like you're putting a piece of yourself out there. So I, and, and that is a vulnerable place to be. And so I don't know if I necessarily was secure enough to do it professionally until, until later when I, um, you know, sort of made my way there. On the second, uh, I do. So I, um, I'm a little bit old school. I have sort of a, an actual physical folder of, you know, articles and things like that that I see and I cut out and I just sort of save. Um, but then I also use an app um, and you know, Evernote, really. And and just I have a sort of a, a file in there for quotes, any quotes I see or turns of phrase that I read. And they might not be in speeches or nonfiction. They could be in fiction or poetry or, you know, the caption of a painting, and you can find inspiration anywhere. Or just, you know, if there's an interesting story, something, you know, that seems kind of whimsical or a good example of a policy, I might not be working on anything related to that right now, but I just kind of save it, you know, and think maybe, maybe this will be a useful metaphor at some point. And if I'm stuck on a speech or I don't have an idea for an opening or something, I can just kind of scroll through all of these tidbits that I've collected over the years and maybe something will turn out to be useful. For inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, Greg Harris, I teach you a writing class. And, and on that note, actually, my question was, you know, as a writer, you're writing these speeches. Of course, you're writing for voice. You're writing for Obama's voice, and he's a great speaker. But is it was? do you ever get involved in the level of coaching or suggesting delivery of certain lines? Like, as a writer, you're like this really needs to sound this way, and then is it is it is is that still in his voice or in your voice or how, how do you how, how do you think about delivery? I guess as you're writing. Um, I never had to do that with President Obama because I would never deign to tell President Obama how to deliver a line. Um, but one of the 
one of the sort of events I'm, I'm typically involved in is that I've been on the last three uh, Democratic National Convention speech writing teams. And those are really fun and interesting experiences because you're on a team of speech writers and you're writing 100 speeches for all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And so some are politicians who are more seasoned than other politicians, and some are just regular people who might we may have invited to come and give a speech about how the Affordable Care Act you know, saved their lives or something. And in those situations, and, and also with clients, I do, I do coaching. And in those situations, you know, again, you're not trying to give them a line that they are not comfortable with. And through coaching someone, you can figure out whether some line that maybe you help them write and they just accept it, when they're trying to deliver it, it doesn't work for them, right? It's through the practice and the coaching and the delivery that people are, come to understand how they speak, how they, you know, what kinds of words work for them, what sort of cadence makes sense for them. And it is only through practice that you can do that. So um, I think coaching is actually a huge, it is important. Um, and it's best if the speechwriter themselves can do it so that you can sort of work together to hone the draft. And not everybody's comfortable speaking. I mean, public speaking is, isn't it the number one fear um, for, for people? Um, and so part of your job is, I think coaching is important because part of your job is to help people get comfortable, you know, delivering a speech. And the only way they can do that is by finding the right words, right? So. I want to end uh, with one last question of my own, which is, I personally love the State of the Union. I sort of get misty eyed watching the State of the Union when almost no matter who the president is, because I like the pageantry, I like the tradition. I even like the laundry list because I think it's interesting. That said, uh, Josh Terrell wrote, I thought, a really good piece in the New York Times right before the State of the Union suggesting that we should do away with this stupid pageant and instead we should do a highly produced show it would be more meaningful to the American people, kind of in the way that the January 6th committee was a, was a produced show. And then Jack Schaefer at Politico took it a step further and said, stop giving this speech. The Constitution doesn't say you have to. Just write an email and send it to Congress. What's your reaction to those two suggestions? I mean, I think they're both really interesting suggestions. For those of you who don't know, the State of the Union, which was just the president's annual message, is required by the Constitution, but it's not, it doesn't have to be a speech. And in fact, for a long time, it wasn't. It was initially Thomas Jefferson, who, mm. beautiful writer, a horrible public speaker, um, did, did not want to deliver a speech in front of Congress. They say that his inaugural address could barely be heard. He was such a bad speaker. So he delivered as a letter, and it stayed that way for quite some time until Woodrow Wilson changed, changed the, the practice back. He said, I'm going to go to Congress. He, he, he delivered a speech to Congress at the end of the previous year, and he thought it went well, and it was meaningful. So he said, I'm going to go back and say, you know, let's have this conversation. And everybody was shocked. They couldn't believe he was doing it. And now we all have to suffer through this hour-long speech that Adam Lusk. Hour plus. <laughs> um, so all to say, it, it doesn't have to be that way. It can go a number of different ways. I thought the suggestion of turning it into sort of a pageant, entertainment, you know, I have my own issues with that, with the notion that everything has to be entertainment. However, he's not wrong. And it reminds me, felt, yeah. yeah, and it reminds me of something we did at the 2020 convention. We had to make it entirely virtual. Obviously, this was in the middle of the pandemic. And we really did turn it into sort of a show. The speeches were much shorter. We had musical performances. It was it was just a totally different convention. And I think it went really well. It was successful, and people connected with it in a very different way. So there is something to that. That said, I would argue that Biden kind of did that by sparring with Congress. It sort of became the prime minister's question. Right. And... And I, at first, when he, when he started kind of sparring, my, I don't know if anybody else just in my heart stopped. Oh yeah. my gosh. This is, <laughs> but he went great because yeah. he was in his element. I mean, there's no, he spent 36 years debating these guys, right? This, yeah. is, this is his jam. And so it went really well. And I think that people liked it. People liked the, the, the open conflict. Let's talk about issues. Mm -hmm. And he did. And so maybe that's potentially leading us to a new path forward. I don't know. That would be fun. Well, first, let me thank all of you and this wonderful audience here in, in, in Cambridge and our audience on the web. And um, uh, I'm really enjoying this series. My next guest is in, in April, April 21st, is going to be James Bennett, who's a Lexington columnist for The Economist and formerly the editor of the New York Times editorial page and formerly editor of The Atlantic. Uh, and most of all, let me thank uh, Sarda Perry for, for giving us your, your wisdom and your time. Thank you, Sarda. Thank Wonderful. you for having me. This is very fun. Thank you, everyone.